All right, I'll get started. Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is September 28th, 2022. It's one o'clock and I call this meeting to order. Let's see, um, we are on the cusp of our first retailers opening in Vermont. Um, I thought I might just do a very brief recap um, as to how we got here. Um, I know we're all trying to collectively forget the pandemic, um, but this agency was born at the height of COVID. Um, one of the many consequences of that timing is that there were significant delays in appointing the board members. Um, instead of starting on January 1st, uh, 2021, we started on April 19th. And I know people might think a four month delay, what's the big deal? Um, the problem is, is that so much of our early work could not proceed until it was blessed by the legislature. You know, the fundamental um, questions about our market structure, our fee structure, um, our budget, and our staffing request. Um, we didn't even have an office or an executive director by the time the legislature had left town for the year, let alone a solid idea of what this market should look like what our staffing needs were going to be, um, or whether we would need to cover our budget entirely with the fees that we collected from our licensees. And once the legislature adjourns for the year, there's no way to call them back um, and say, hey, can you approve these plans for us? Uh, we had to wait until earlier this year. And even then, it took some time for the legislature to feel comfortable with what we were pro proposing and give us permission to proceed. There's a metaphor you often hear when talking to other cannabis regulators um, about building a plane while it's taking off. Um, I think our situation was much more in the realm of building a parachute while we were in free fall, um, hurtling towards this May 1st date um, for licensing cultivators. It's uh, hard to imagine, but until July of 2022, um, we literally only had four full-time staff members. Um, and the medical team. Uh, but boy, have they moved mountains. Um, I lived through the days of the Vermont Health Connect. I can tell you that building an online application portal um, sounds simple enough in the abstract, um, but can be quite challenging in reality. We built ours in a matter of months. And while the early iterations were a little bit clunky, um, they worked and they've gotten much better with each iteration. A huge thank you to our director of licensing and our partners at ADS for standing that up. Um, our general counsel, David, has uh, set the bar for how all other agencies now need to measure themselves with respect to rulemaking. Um, the Secretary of State's office is responsible for the administration of the rulemaking process. And so early on, when we were preparing them for our rule filings, um, I happen to ask, and it was the quickest they'd ever seen a rule move from its initial fi filing to final adoption. Their answer was something along the lines of, um, for a non-controversial and relatively straightforward rule, maybe five months. Um, our rules are about as complex and controversial as they come, and they were done in less than four months. Um, this, is, this feels to me like one of those sports records that will never be broken. Um, when it comes to licensing, I know there's a lot of frustration with the pace of issuing licenses, and um, I empathize with that. People have put a lot of time and money on the line to move out of the legacy market and participate in this industry. Um, my message to you, if you have a pending application, is stick with us. We will get to you. Um, we're doing something completely out of the ordinary in Vermont. You know, the path of least resistance for the board would have been to give licenses to a small number of large operators. This makes our job easy. Um, it's a fraction of the cost and time to um, license and regulate one 50,000 square foot cultivator as opposed to 50,000 square foot cultivators. We could have proposed a market structure that handed this market over to large corporations by making licenses inaccessible through fees, regulations, startup costs, or license tiering. Instead, we designed our rules to allow small operators to take full first advantage of this market. I know everyone feels the sting of each regulation, so this point might not feel pertinent, but we did waive about a third of our rules for tier one cultivators. 
the result is 179 of our 222 licensed cultivators are tier one small cultivators. We have exactly five tier five cultivators. This market belongs to small growers in a way that no other state market does. We are committed to further reducing the cost of compliance for you and increase market access, but we need to do it in a measured way. And we need to demonstrate success at every stage. We know that there, that we know that we are requiring a lot of everyone, um, even the tier ones, um, but every single, single regulation we propose is tied to a statutory mandate, whether that's insurance, banking, environmental, testing, or public safety. For those, we can't remove rules until we change statutes. And we can't change statutes until legislators start seeing this industry embrace the core mission of consumer safety, youth prevention, and equity. Anyway, our staff has done a tremendous job in getting us to this point. We're back on track to where we were supposed to be issuing retail licenses by October 1st. I have no idea how anyone in the legislature expected us to issue licenses by this point, but somehow everyone here stepped up. Um, and when I say stepped up, I mean that our staff has worked through family vacations. They've worked nights and weekends. They work through sicknesses. At least four of us have had confirmed cases of COVID. Um, none of that has slowed us down. Um, and you know, no one here gets a bonus if they get through 10 applications instead of five or if they spend an extra hour on the phone with a person who needs help with their application. Um, our staff has been hustling because they feel the urgency and importance of the work we're doing. It's a dedication to the mission and a belief in Vermont that drives us to do more and push harder here. But I say that in full recognition that this pace we've been operating at is not sustainable. 230-ish licenses in five months is incredible but it's not something that we can keep doing under our current staffing regime. We have three full-time employees dedicated to the all use, adult use licensing program and five compliance staff. I would challenge anyone to present me with a cannabis board that's done a better job in getting licenses out more effectively, efficiently, or equitably than our team has done. I say that in the same breath that I'm saying that I'm directing our staff to slow down to a more sustainable pace. We are in this for the long haul, um, we can see supply chain bottlenecks developing that we need to address. We will continue to work through our pending licenses, but I suspect the number of approvals each week might slow down as we focus on a broader and more complex set of work. Julie, Kyle, is there anything you want to add just, you know, on the verge of this market opening at this point? Um, I I agree with everything you said, uh, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate your comments. And, and I just want to add my thanks to the staff. It really has been an incredible um, thing to watch people take, you know, words that we put on paper and turn them into action um, and setting records and putting those words on paper. So I appreciate all of the hard work that's gone into this. Thank you. Yeah, ditto. Likewise, I can't look around at the people looking at us enough. Um, <laughs> With a with a, a sense of gratitude, I, I think for folks listening, you know, I remember back to our first couple board meetings, and one of uh, you know nobody was really familiar with the three of us, and I think um, we've spent at least at the beginning and, and continuing over the last eighteen months a, a tremendous amount of time trying to get the trust of folks that are interested in this community. And trust isn't built overnight. Trust isn't built in eighteen months. But I, I know a lot of folks are, are frustrated out there. Um, but we're going to do everything we can uh, to, to help folks who want to be in this marketplace find their footing. Um, so remember that the next time that you're frustrated. Um, don't be so quick to react that the sky is falling. Um, remember, everything that we've done has been to help small cultivators find their place here instead of big businesses coming in. And, and as, as the chair alluded to, that, that would be a lot easier for us to do internally. And it's not the direction that any of us want to see this market take place. So thank you for bearing with us. So product registration, just a few notes about that. Um, the product registration form and corresponding payment portal will be live on our website by the end of the day um, at ccb.vermont.gov forward slash forms. Um, this is a key component of our consumer safety mandate where licensees will be providing information to the board about labeling, packaging, 
test res in the test results of the individual products that they're going to be bringing to market. Um, this only has to happen once per product type, um, and it can happen at the cultivator, or the wholesaler, or the product manufacturer, or the retail level. But generally speaking, it will be the responsibility of the licensee that's putting their name on the product to register that product. It should be fairly straightforward with respect to cannabis products. Um, when it comes to flour, you need a registration for each individual cultivar. Um, each cultivar only needs to be registered once, but if there is a different cannabinoid profile, that needs to be registered on its own. Um, the form uh, is a Microsoft form. This is a temporary solution while we build this functionality into our primary licensing portal. And speaking of Microsoft Forms, I did want to turn things over to Carrie to do some additional guidance on inventory tracking. We've um, included in our agenda today a Q, uh, question and answer period so that people can ask questions directly um, and get comfortable with some of the terminology we're using and the data points. Uh, but before we turn things over to you, Carrie, um, I just want to approve the minutes. Um, you guys had a chance to look at those? Yep. All right. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Carrie, are you with us? I am. Yep. Yep. Are you ready to uh, get going on the in, uh, cultivation inventory tracking? Sure. Yes, we can do that. Um, I'm going to have to share my screen here and uh, thank you for the floor chairman. This might take a second, um, but for the folks at home, I wanted to sort of introduce some topics that we we've come up with to sort of help us put this all together. Um, that's not the one. All right, so <laughs> my technological challenge here, one sec. Oh, let's go. <laughs> there, I wanted to wanted to start here before I delve into the process uh, for growers for inventory tracking. And one of the terms I wanted to highlight is harvest lot. Um, a harvest lot is in our rule. It's sort of described. It's separated by uh, strain or or cultivar, um, but that's not what we're doing. Um, here, that's a relic from the hemp program. Um, in this case, we're going to divide or define harvest lot as any cannabis that was grown in the same lot. So regardless of cultivar, if you planted it at the same time, it's on the same flower cycle, it received the same inputs um, and was harvested around the same time. I know uh, plants mature at different different times, but in the in the same sort of week, um, we're going to call that a harvest lot and primarily for the sake of testing so that one harvest lot receives the pesticide test. And then that harvest lot um, will be broken up into process lots and if folks think of a better term, that's fine, but <clears throat> right now we're calling them process lots. And the process lot is w whatever you break that harvest lot down into. So if you are selling the entire thing as fresh frozen, it's one harvest lot. If you're selling <clears throat> trim trimming and selling premium flour to directly to a retail operation, that batch of um, premium flour is a process lot. If the trim from that lot is being sold to extraction, um, that is its own process lot. If you've got multiple sort of cultivars in that field and you want to sell them separately, each one can become its own process lot, but you can recombine the trim and sell that as a process lot. And this flow chart that's up sort of 
dictates when and where the the consumer protection testing needs to occur. Um, but I wanted to start there um, before we move into the form have, and um, did my screen switch? It did. All right. Um, this is the Microsoft forms that we will be posting online at the end of the week. Um, and I'll walk through, this is for outdoor cultivators. Um, and I'll, I'll fill this out so folks can see what's happening and ask questions at the end. So name of the establishment, um, license type, mixed outdoors so this is a drop down list for all the cultivation types we currently have um, listed the tier six is on there even though we don't have any tier six but this is for all the outdoor types we have have a different form for indoor and um, it's basically the same but it asks more questions about when you initiated flower um, and then your license number And we're asking you to report on a biweekly basis. So I'm a little bit behind here. I'm going to say the reporting period that I'm reporting on is from the third to the to the seventeenth. And then for harvest lot number, this is I'm going to use my registration number and just put a sequential number on there. Um, and then the, for the process lot, I'm going to use the basically the same number as the harvest lot. Um, and then an additional identifier. Um, we're going to add a, a, another question to this form that that will let you say that this process lot is trim, it's flower, it's waste, whatever it is. You're you'll um, describe the process lot, but I'm just going to call it A. So A and A in this case is um, is my premium flower, and I I didn't I wasn't licensed uh, till June, so June 4th is when I planted that, um, and I'm harvest I harvested last week. Um, and it asks about growing style. This is this is sort of an important question based on the analytics um, that we will be applying to to your answers. But I'm an outdoor cultivator. I grew it in in ground, and I'm only going to have one process lot. So I grew 125 plants, and this. Final weight is in grams. So I've got about, you know, I did all right. I got about 45 pounds of flour, which is, is you know, a little bit over 20,000 grams. And we're asking for it in grams because I didn't want to necessarily get into issues with uh, significant figures as far as pounds are concerned. So if we keep it all in grams, that makes it easier for us. Um, and these questions will become optional. So I said that was, this is, this is, this process lot is my premium flower and I'm only reporting on that flower, the, the trim. And I didn't sell fresh frozen to a processor, but so the trim will be the second harvest or process lot from this harvest lot and i'll do that on a successive form when i get down here to process lot um, so these questions after 12 are specific to how you sort of marketed your cannabis um, i'm going to basically say yes i have a second process lot and what i would do is fill out the information again and it's and then when it's uh,
this this second process lot is is the waste so i had you know 40 over 40,000 um, or 40,000 grams of waste and then i didn't have another process lot and then there's an attestation at the end of that form and then i would hit submit and your information comes to the board so i need to put in the process lot and Sorry, I was trying to go quick. And then that information comes to the board um, and ends up in our database. And we have these forms for indoor growers. Um, in the, the mixed tier folks would have to fill out um, either indoor or outdoor based on whatever that harvest lot is. Um, and the rest of the inventory tracking forms um, are will also be available. And what we're adding, we'll add instructions on how to fill those out um, as well. Um, but I'll stop at the cultivation form for now. And our goal is to have those available next week. Um, one other topic that I sort of did want to make sure we covered because retail is opening and folks have asked is, let's see, <clears throat> the weight equivalents. Um, I thought we could go over this um, briefly. Um, can you see that screen? Yes. Yep. Um, so your sales your sales uh, can be up to the equivalent of one ounce of flour. And I didn't bother with the um, decimal points after 28 grams because there's a lot of assumptions. So we use the regulatory level of 30% for flour. And I didn't convert between THCA, didn't use the um, whole theoretical calculation. But at the uh, 28 grams, 30% flour is 8,400 milligrams of THC at 30%. So equivalency for that for concentrate would be 14 grams of concentrate at 60% or um, eight one gram baked cartridges at 100% will bring you about 8,000 milligrams of THC or edibles packaged at 50 milligrams per package is um, 168 50 milligram packages is equivalent to one ounce of flour or any combination thereof as long as your customer is staying at or below 84 100 milligrams of THC will consider that equivalent to an ounce of flour. And I will stop sharing now and open Sorry, it up. We have, uh, yeah, we, we put on the agenda some time for Q&A uh, with you. Um, are you prepared for, for that? I am. Maybe okay. Bridget asked hard questions, so we'll see. Ellie, could you help us with the order that people are raising their hands? Yep. <clears throat> Just do this like public comment? Yes, please. Okay, so Bridget is up first. For the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I just was I had a question about the process slots there when you were going to them. So if you have a harvest slot and your, your process slot, you're only getting one process slot out of that that you're actually going to market with. So you're only going to market with your A flower, but you have waste from that, from those plants. Is that a second process lot? Or it seemed like in the form, there was actually a place for waste in the first process lot that, hey, I'm harvesting these 125 plants. I'm only taking flower to market. The rest is waste. And so it looked like you went down to a second process lot there. And so I'm a little bit confused by that. Yep. Um, so we do have a form for 
just documenting your waste on. And at this point, you you can either you can take either route. You can use the um, reduction form, your reduction in inventory form to report waste, or you can do it right there on the um, process lot form. I don't feel like it's a process lot, especially if it's root balls and stems that are waste. But um, either way, we can capture that information, whether it's done in the in the reduction form or as a process lot, and you're calling the rest of that waste. Okay, and I had one other quick question if I if I'm able to do it. Just wondering, um, as you collect this data, are you going to be kind of making publicly known how much product is actually becoming available into the market? So we have a sense of, you know, as a consumer, what's available and as a, an operator, as a retailer, what is actually out there and available to sell or at least coming into the market because it's been um, registered as a, a lot that's in process. Yep, that that's a goal, Bridget. And as we move forward with, we're working with a couple different um, IT vendors right now. This is an interim solution. In mid-November, we should be going live with a more permanent solution um, that will have data analytics um, from a company called NCS. And you'll be able to sort of see all of that on our website in a dashboard form. But between now and December, um, you may not have that information available. We'll do the best we can. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Corbin's finest. Corbin's finest, are you there? Nelly, why don't you move on and uh, if they put their hand back up, we can get them. All right, sounds good. Um, Yarim is next. Hello, everyone. Uh, Yarim Plantillas, Rick Clover Analytics. Uh, I actually have three, uh, two questions and a comment. Uh, with the questions is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I still have not seen anything that um, that states how much of the harvest lot is to be tested. Um, it'd say tier one, it's fine and dandy, but tier fives are gonna be a little more difficult because if you're saying, oh, only, you only have to test the harvest lot, tier five can grow a thousand plants in a, in a tier five of the same, at the same time, of, of several cultivars or the same cultivar, are uh, you telling me they only can only have to have one test for the no whatever thousand plants that can go in that area? Uh, so need to be a little bit more clarify cl clear on how much of the harvest lot are we to test. The other one, uh, if you want to answer that, or you want to. I mean, sure, both, so. um, sure. I can. So if they are, if the tier five is not broke if the, if that tier five is broken up into smaller grow rooms each grow room will be a separate harvest lot and we will provide uh, sampling guidance on the website um, similar to what the hemp program uses about how to take a representative sample but if that tier five is growing all in one in one big room and like i said uh, when I define harvest lot, if that is getting all the same inputs, whether that's pest, prote pest protection inputs or fertilization inputs, um, soil amendment inputs, um, as long as they can get a representative sample off that harvest lot, uh, we're comfortable. Perfect. That's what I was asking, the representative sample, because we need to know how much out of, you know, a thousand plants are we, are we to test. Uh, the other one is I didn't uh, did not see anything on the reporting part on labs. Are we part of the reporting uh, reporting uh, on their uh, for trace? Um, you're going to be captured as a loss for the cultivator, so they will submit how much they 
sample they submitted to the lab as a loss, but you won't be required since you're not actually producing uh, cannabis, you're pr producing results. So as long as your lab has in internal inventory tracking and sample tracking through a limb system, we're comfortable. Um, when we come in and audit your records, we'll be able to see how long you retain a sample and how you discard it. And uh, other than that, you won't you won't be uh, responsible for tracking inventory through this Excellent. system. Thank you. Well, I kind of thought so, and I kind of hoped that that was the case. And my last one is uh, I have reached out to you to get a few things in line uh, for what you guys need from us, you know, to, to our license, and you still have not gotten back to me. And it's been almost a month, and I really need to get moving with all this stuff because uh, uh, we are being held back by several things, and um, and um, and be able to get a license is one of them. Uh, but that's it. Thank you very much for your two the two answers you gave me. Mm -hmm. All right, Jason Powell is next. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just curious about the timing on reporting a process lot. I guess we wait until everything's dried and then we're able to report on weights and everything. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yep, um, just keep track of the number of plants in that harvest lot. And um, once it's broken down, you'll be able to fill out the form. Thank you. Keith. Hello. Hello, Keith. Oops, Keith, I You're, think I might have uh, accidentally muted you again. I'm sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Oh, are we there again? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have one question. Who is the company? Do you have a contract with NCS now? And how much is that contract costing you? Keith, you can submit that as a Public Records Act request. This is really about answering specific I never questions get answers to, to cultivation. I never get an answer, sorry. Uh, this is public well, knowledge, and I never get answers from you guys. I've sent you so many emails, you never respond. Nobody responds to me. If you can send me an email as a public record act request, and I will respond to you. Okay, well, I'll bring the other question back. How are you going to track 125 plants from seedling all the way through the chain of command, all the way up through to retail sales to go out the door. <clears throat> What's the chain of command there? So when you have plant a seed in the ground, there should be a tracking number from that seed that follows that single cultivator from that <clears throat> plot all the way through. Every single plant should be tracked so for safety. I have another, one more thing, metric.com. Titan security market, simplifies the recall, docs chain of custody, ensures proper tax accounts, eases inspections and auditing, re repairs burdens, starts toll in, started in 2011 in Colorado, standard in the cannabis industry in 21 states and two countries. Mm -hmm. Serves 300,000 people. Keith, can I just interrupt you for a second? I'm just trying to get some um, information out there. This, yeah, this is not about people explaining things to the board. This is the board trying to help cultivators understand our tracking requirements. Um, and you're taking time I've away from this, the people that actually I've have to deal with this system. I've been in another state and done it through metric previously. It is so much easier than what you guys are offering the state of Vermont. This is very complicated, but thank you for your time. Thanks, Keith. There are not other states. John is next, John Cronin. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have a question about the final weight um, in weighing the, the, um, the waste. Um, for, for example, I wasn't even thinking about weighing the root balls, but I, I mean, I could do that, but 
but uh, initially I just I harvested a couple plants and I weighed them out of the ground. Uh, and then I weighed them once they've been um, uh, blocked and all the fan leaves and stuff are off. I'm going to weigh them once the buds are removed and, and trimmed. I'm going to weigh them once they're cured. Am I on the right, tra right track there? Yes, you, you are. And oh. um, the sort of root ball and stem is legacy from what the medical program was required to do. Um, we're not necessarily going that far. If you're leaving the roots in the ground, don't dig them up and weigh them. Okay. But uh, your your hanging plants, just uh, the most important thing is um, number of plants versus pounds of flower. But we're asking you to report that in grains. Um, That's fine. So the, in terms of the waste, um, I'm now starting to, because of the, the wet weather, I'm now starting to go through and defoliate everything. All those leaves are on the ground. That's waste. I don't have to worry about that. Okay. You don't. You don't. No. Once once you've got it hung and dried, um, okay. the waste is going to vary. But really, um, the analytics that are being applied really based are based on number of plants mm -hmm. and pounds of dry usable flour that are produced from the, that number of plants. And while we were capturing waste, like you said, it's getting to be a tough time of year. You might scrap a plant or two entirely from that harvest lot, and that would be good for us to know. So if you have previously reported that you had 125 plants in the ground and you only harvested 120, we're going to wonder where those other five plants are. So that why, that's why that sort of reduction in waste um, is is available for you guys to report to us. Okay. I, did I answer your question? Uh, yep, I, I, I'm listening carefully too. I, it does seem yep. way simpler. I, I just missed something. You broke up a little, John, but yeah, primarily keep track of number of plants harvested and weight of flower and weight of trim. Okay. Those are our most important um, tracking pieces. So we're not going to have to sign up with a company to, tr to do any tracking and tracing at, at a large fee to us? Correct. That's why we're building this system. Some folks may in the future choose to do that. Um, as it the reporting will be seamless, um, but we're designing a system that won't require that because we have so many small small scale growers. Thank you. I just want to say I am so grateful for the way that you guys are doing this. You started this thing. I know it had to be really difficult, um, but we, what you're doing, I've never felt that you were on, have our best interest at heart here. Uh, I've never lost confidence in that. And you know, I really appreciate the small grower work, the uh, thought that has gone into this. Um, and I do feel like you're helping us with our brands in the future with this good start. So thank you. Thank you. Jeff. Here, uh, you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, just wanted to uh, thank everyone for all your hard work. And uh, yeah, I do also appreciate the focus on the small growers. Um, that said, um, I did have a question about um, on that first screen where you were selecting your tier type. Um, as a mixed grower, say I was reporting an outdoor, would I select mixed there and then later would it ask yeah. me for indoor or outdoor? Yes, yes, absolutely. So there, there'll be a separate form um, for indoor and outdoor grow basically because you can control more on the indoor grow and well you'll give us information about the time that the plants were in veg and when you started the flowering cycle and how long that flowering cycle was but um you'll select your appropriate license type because that'll be tied back to your license number Okay, so and, I do that, and then the next screen, it would identify indoor or outdoor from there. Correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. Perfect. Thanks. Kate. 
Hello. Um, thank you for all that you guys do. I just had one quick question. And that is, will we be able to integrate the inventory tracking system that you guys are putting together to a third party program like LeafLogix? Uh, Kay, we're having these discussions now. That will be the goal. It will not be true of this interim solution. But like I said, by December or or so we don't have a deadline for that the deadline is november or the timeline is november but i'm you know being optimistic that we'll optimistic that we'll have something in place by december and we will um offer that to different companies to sort of try and connect to our system um automatically but that won't be true for this interim interim solution okay thank you Tree Frog Farms. Hi guys, um, I just had two quick questions. Is there, uh, for the scales we use, will there be any calibration requirements or accuracy requirements of the scale down to 0 0.01 grams or anything like that? And as far as I'm understanding, even if we harvest uh, different plants at different times, you would like us to submit these records after everything is in and dried and trimmed and we have a total for the whole field. Uh, those are my questions. Yep, so it's really up to you to decide what you choose a harvest lot is. But um, as we've defined harvest lot, if you planted it at the same time, it received all the same inputs and it's on the same light cycle which outdoor is but you're harvesting over the course of a week or two um then let us know and you're calling that a harvest lot to do one pesticide test the pesticide tests are expensive and so we're we're, we're assuming that uh, that re residue will be the same because you've it treated that entire harvest lot the same so <laughs> Yeah, Basically. my only thought was that, yeah, I would have a whole field, everything would be given all the same inputs, but by yeah. growing different strains, I might harvest one strain four or five yeah. weeks earlier than another one. So I didn't know if I should start reporting as soon as I had that one strain dried or after the whole field is done and taken down. So we're going to leave that up to you, but as this sort of is required every two weeks, you can either update the information that you've submitted or give it to us all at once and just say it's in process it's drying okay thank you very much mm -hmm. justin oh wait i'm sorry i missed a question about the scales um any scale that's used in commerce does need to be a certified scale and the uh, sort of weights and measures folks at the agency of ag can certify your scale um but if you're if that hasn't happened um that can happen at the retail level certainly but you should at least be out to two decimal place, places with a gram scale Justin, sorry to interrupt. No, quite all right. Um, my question is regarding fresh frozen, um, especially with our 60% concentrate cap law. In order to do the separations necessary, we require very high quality inputs in our concentrates and really every processor does. Um, I didn't notice an ability to uh, register a fresh frozen product or a fresh never frozen product, which is going to be a serious point of necessity for the solventless market, especially, but even the solvent based market. Uh, that's all. Justin, what so products that aren't offered for retail sale don't need registration? Uh, I mean, like every product or uh, every harvest lot seems to reference a drying point. So, can these farmers register their product fresh because we would never dry the biomass? we'd be purchasing it frozen, fresh harvested. Yeah, so that product won't be offered at the retail establishment. They'll sell that product to a processor or a manufacturer. So that product does not need to be registered as fresh frozen, but the concentrate that it produces 
um, would need to be registered. Okay. Only if it's offered for retail sale. So if you're doing fresh frozen concentrate and then selling it to somebody who's putting that in a vape cart, those vape carts need to be registered. Whatever's being offered for sale in the retail establishment needs to be registered, but the interim, the process extracts don't need registration. Okay, so farmers will be able to input their harvest as wet weight. Absolutely, and that's, okay, I'm perfect. sorry I went through the form fairly quickly, but you do have an option for giving us fresh frozen weight. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Terry, I'm just gonna give you a quick time check. Um, you know, we scheduled 30 minutes. We have about 10 minutes left um, on that 30 minutes. So Nelly, if you wouldn't mind just kind of prioritizing first time questioners, we can vary. We can do this again if we need to. Um, I know there are a lot of questions around this, and um, we do have a way to, for people to kind of ask questions, submit them as a kind of public comment, and we can get back to them. But um, and I do think the, this kind of helps us stand up additional guidance or FAQs, yeah. so on and so <laughs> forth, that, that we can kind of get on our website as well. Jesse, so much. Um, first question is the harvest lot number, Carrie. Is that something we choose and assign? I know you used a registration number, but we don't yeah, necessarily yeah. have that. Um, are you a cultivator, Jesse? Yes, I am. And I thought one of the first things you did was put in yeah. what was called a harvest lot number. Yep. Yeah. In the interim, while you're waiting for your license number, I would suggest you, you do have a number that the board um, has oh, that's provided. our license number, is the harvest lot number. Yes. Okay, yes. very good. So use your license number, and then I just, for the first harvest lot, I put 001. Okay. Um, so your license number and then a sequential number um, for harvest lot. Um, as we move forward with developing a new system, those could potentially be auto-generated by a system, but I also wanted to give growers some flexibility. So I didn't want to tie it to a date. So just a sequential number after your license number is sufficient for harvest lot. Okay, very good. And I think the biggest question uh, for me and probably for other growers is just how to organize this. And I, I hear that you guys are giving us a lot of flexibility in how we orient ourselves to harvest lot versus process lot. Uh, but just to try to get some clarification here, um, for testing, um, not just pesticide testing, but the other required testing from a lab, is that going to be based off of a strain a harvest lot or a process lot? So the short answer is yes. And that's only because you get to decide. Um, okay, so even if we had 300 plants of um, and 22 strains, we could choose to test all the testing requirements for one, uh, one sample. So as if long that, as it's all, you yeah, know, it's if you are there. going to harvest, if you're going to do that as a harvest lot, your mm -hmm. entire field, then that, and it had all the same inputs, then you only need one sort of pesticide test on that harvest lot. But then depending on where, where that goes, um, if it's, if that flower is is the process lot is flour to, to be a smokable flour, then it needs the potency test, the microbiological test. In moisture, you'll get from the lab, but we're looking for something below 13% just for for uh, shelf stability. And then if, it, if it's being offered for extraction, I don't know if you can see the screen, I popped up flow chart back up. If that process lot is being offered for extraction, um, you'll probably want a cannabinoid test um, just so you can get paid appropriately. But then it breaks down that processor 
yeah, but all I the see, testing I see will be. Those. But really, I think my question is, um, is just the clarification that you guys are saying one plant is okay to do all of the required testing depending on the license. A sub. Or subsample. A, a subsample, yes. Okay, very good. Um, all right, and then do we need a separate process lot um, for flower versus pre-roll, or it's just really flower versus uh, concentrate versus edible? So if it's smokable flower is synonymous with pre-roll. Okay, very good. Of, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then last one. Sorry to cut you off, Carrie. I just want to get through these, nope, uh, but good. I appreciate your thoroughness. Um, and so the only last thing I'm thinking is just reporting. You guys are requiring that we report bi-weekly, but I'm feeling like it would be more straightforward if once everything is dried and then we get a proper weight all at once, it might be, uh, make more sense to then do the reporting, but you're saying if we cut something down, we'll have a space to just say, hey, it's not dry, it's not weighed yet, but we'll do that on the next reporting. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of a conversation that the board has been having and we'll, we'll take your input. I agree with you, but we, we were advised um, by other um, folks who do this work that uh, it keeps it on uh, cultivators radar to have a, a timeline for reporting mm -hmm. um, we don't want you to forget to report because <laughs> then we'll just show up <laughs> okay um, well I think my uh, my two cents on that and then I'll uh, leave and end on this is that I think uh, just because this is an interim thing and you guys are transitioning in December to something else um, as a cultivator it would be really helpful for me to harvest everything, get it all organized, properly dried, cured, and then weighed, and then report, and then just have the requirement that I can't sell to a retail or anywhere until I report. Then it won't go off my radar, but then I have everything organized instead of putting in a little information here, a little bit there. Um, I feel like there's a lot bigger um, space to make a mistake if I'm trying to do that in the midst of uh, trying to dry and cure and everything. So that's it. Thank you guys so much. Um, and Carrie, thank you for coming on. You're very brave in the midst of such stressful times. <laughs> Have a good one, you guys. Thank you, Janice. Tyler. Hi, uh, thank you. And just two quick questions for you. One, just to clarify about the waste weight for the reporting. Are you saying that we just need to report dry weight? So nothing fresh needs to be reported? I was thinking so, yes. And like I said, waste is is not something we're, we're necessarily cool. tracking. As long as you have waste weight, uh, dry weight is dry weight works. Um, I understand some people buck in the field and the stems just fly out there and they're selling fresh frozen. So we're not going to get a weight for their waste. But if you are hanging a whole plant um, and you're able to sort of get a weight for the waste, it would help our analytics to have that information. Okay, cool. And then second question is, when will the guidance for this be posted or will we be able to access the recording for this? Both are, yes, you'll be able to access a recording and we're hoping for the guidance and the forms to be posted online next week. Perfect, that's it. Thank you guys for everything you do. Carrie, I'm gonna uh, stop you there. Um, Everyone who still has their hand up, please, uh, these questions are, are incredibly important. Um, I can hear, um, you know, the urgency in everyone's voice and the kind of concern to get this right. Please go to our website, fill out the public input form, put, put your questions in there, and that'll really help us kind of understand where, the, where questions remain, where further clarification is needed. And um, this recording will be available um, on our YouTube page 
just search CCB Vermont um, and uh, look there. Uh, should be up, I think, usually by the end of the day. Um, so uh, you can go back and watch some of the answers to these questions, and we'll keep keep kind of getting good information out there. Um, we need to just very, continue uh, to move through the agenda. Yep, Nelly. Sorry, very quickly. Um, this meeting is actually live streamed, so it's already up on YouTube. Oh, great. Okay, great. Look at that. All right. <laughs> um, thank you, Carrie. Um, that's you know, I know it's never easy to kind of roll with the punches uh, live like this, but it, that was really helpful. Um, Brent, can we turn to you for the reviewing of staff recommendations on licensure and social equity status? Okay, so here is the board's register for this week, um, starting with medical program, as always. Uh, you can see here that the staff issued uh, 70 patient cards this last week. Um, so that looks like about nine more than were received, um, applications and renewal applications received. So staff is working through um, our backlog, and we're hoping to be operating within those 30 days uh, very quickly. So moving on to our adult use license application numbers. Um, here is your wall of numbers for this week. Um, important numbers are down at the bottom. We've got 13 applications up for uh, board approval for a license this week. Um, and just a couple of things to highlight here. Um, you can see we've got a whole lot of zeros um, over here in the submitted category and the received category. Staff um, are have really done a great job of processing um, most of the cultivator applications, um, and they are most of them are in incomplete or resubmitted status. We do have two new applications for small indoor cultivators this week. Um, one new outdoor small cultivator, one new mixed cultivator, um, just in this last week. Um, we have seven new retail applications as of this week, um, one new wholesaler, and only one new manufacturer. Um, but the number that's changing kind of the most rapidly is the employee ID card number. And again, those are um, applications that our staff are able to review and approve without board approval. Um, but just wanted to note that we've gotten, I think, close to between 35 and 40 new um, employee ID card applications just this week. Um, so that's a big part of the work that the licensing team is doing behind the scenes. And on those, um, can you just remind me, uh, employees do not need to go through a CSI background check. That's right, that's right. They don't have to go through our vendor. Um, they are able to get their fingerprints on their own and submit them to the FBI. Um, to get their own fingerprint supported background check, and we are able to rely on that check to for our process. Okay, any, I'm going to move on to our recommendations for a license. Um, so, as always, these are applicants that have uh, met the requirements for their license that are in our rules and also in statute. So as I said, we have 13 this week. Um, so I'll just go through the list. We have GMT Genetics, uh, Mixed Tier 1 Cultivator, Lamoille Valley Extraction Solutions, a Mixed Tier 1 Cultivator, Brown Dog Cannabis, Indoor Tier 1 Cultivator, Sunbridge Roots, Indoor Tier 1 Cultivator, Four Turtles Farm, Indoor Tier 1 Cultivator, Green Mountain Cannabis North, an indoor tier two cultivator, Green Barn Farm, a mixed tier two cultivator, Sunny View Farm, an indoor tier one cultivator, Mad Hatter Cannabis and Hemp, a mixed tier one cultivator, The Clean Cannabis Company, an indoor tier three cultivator, Priya Commons, a tier three manufacturer, Vermont Bud Barn, a retailer, and Snowbird Botanicals for a tier one manufacturer license. Um, 
So that is your list for um, applicants that staff is recommending for licensure. Um, and this week you do have your, we have one um, staff recommendation for denial of a license. Um, so that is submission number 145. Um, this applicant has applied for an outdoor tier one cultivation license. And um, staff is recommending that the board deny a license for this applicant um, because they are not able to meet the requirements of, um, of our rules. So specifically, it's rule 1.4.9b um, has a requirement that applicants have the right um, to occupy their site of uh, operations. And this applicant is not able to meet that requirement. Um, so some detail for the board um, is that the property is owned and controlled by a person that is a defendant in a criminal um, federal criminal fraud case. That case is unresolved, um, and the federal court has issued both a notice of indictment and a restraining order pursuant to the property. Um, so because of that, um, the applicant is not able to meet that requirement in Rule 1.4.6 in two ways. Um, first, the restraining order that's entered against the property um, imposes prohibitions on encumbering the property or transferring the property um, without prior federal court approval. Um, the applicant does not have that approval from the court. And secondly, um, the indictment documents indicate that the government intends to seek forfeiture of the property in the event that the defendant is convicted. Um, so under those circumstances, the applicant would lose um, their legal right to occupy the land. So for those reasons, staff are recommending um, that the board deny a license for this applicant since they have not demonstrated um, an ability to comply with board of rule. And um, we can, if the board has questions or would like to discuss um, the matter with our general counsel, we can go into executive session after I finish. Let's I don't either. Right. <clears throat> okay. So I'll just move on to the rest of the register. Here's our, an update on our license amendments. Um, so we've got 12 in the queue right now. And as a reminder, these are um, amendments that our staff are processing that um, have to do with the, a licensee's application that don't rise to the level of the type of amendment that would require a renewal. So it's often things like a change of name, a change of business name um, that's requiring staff to process these types of amendments. Um, social equity update. So here is our um, here are our numbers of social equity applicants and where they fall in the process. Um, we have two charts now. The second one provides uh, kind of a pre-determination of social equity status review. So this is the number of people who are still um, have not yet been determined um, to have social equity status by the board. And that number right now is 13. Um, and we've got two recommendations for social equity status approval this week, um, submission number 176 and submission number 1517. Um, and both of these applicants meet the criteria for social equity individual applicant as defined in board rule. So staff is recommending that the board grant social equity status to these um, applicants. That is your list for this week. Any questions for Bryn? Nope. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve the recommendations? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for social equity status and licensing as presented to us by staff in this meeting. Double second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Well, let's um, shift to public comment. Um, do this the way that we always do. If you um, have a public comment um, for the board, please, uh, and you join by the link, please raise your virtual hand. We'll do our best to call on you in the order that you raise your hands, and then we will move on to the folks that join via phone. Ellie, if you could just help us uh, with the order. Absolutely, Yareem is first. Hello, once again, Yareem Plantillas, Ray Clover Analytics. Thank you again for, for your time. 
and uh, all the work that you're doing. I'll keep it quick. Um, I just need to make a comment about uh, being able to move forward with that license. I have reached out to Mr. Kerry, like I said before, and the last time I heard from him was about a month ago, and uh, all he says, oh, I'll get back to you when you're a little more established, which is, uh, to me, uh, really uh, concerning because uh, if we are to move into a market, we need to know what you guys need from us to be able to be licensed. Um, but that is one of my, 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 my concern, my comment for this time around. Uh, if we're not to be, we don't have that, that kind of guidance, I'm afraid that, that this is gonna impact when we come into market. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for about the screaming baby is my daughter. <laughs> no worries. You never have to apologize for that. Thanks, Yarim. Sarah. Hi, um, this is my first meeting. Um, I just participated in the uh, certification uh, led by Jesse Lynn Dolan. And I am uh, some, some questions that come from that. Um, from what I learned, and I um, learned that terpenes influence therapeutic effect and have um, medicinal properties. And I just wanted to note that uh, I think it would be really helpful in guiding um, our consumers as to what to choose for their products if you have information about the terpene content in the flower that we're distributing. Um, as my first comment. And also, I noticed while I'm not professionally trained in alcohol or tobacco um, sales, I um, have a little bit of experience in that industry. And I'm just wondering if the, um, if the information those in those courses compares to the in depth requirements of the blood type course. Um, sorry, I, <laughs> my voice is a little shaky. Um, for example, um, recognizing substance that I learned about, um, I'm not aware of something that's required in those courses, but I am wondering. Um, and then my last comment has to do with concentrate, um, concentrate cap. Um, wondering if we could test for THCA in that uh, category versus testing for THC. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we don't generally uh, answer questions during the public comment period. You were cutting out just a little bit there. Um, you know, if you want some specific answers, maybe if you don't mind, just you know, going on our public input form on our website and submitting those, um, and we'll try and um, get answers to those. Mike. Disappeared me. Mute. Hello? Hi, Mike. Mike. Hey, awesome. Well, I'm Mike. I am Sunnyview Farm. And uh, my wife and I are Sunnyview Farm. And I just want to thank you guys for everything you've done. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Have a great week. You too. Jesse. That was so nice, Mike. We're all like, wait, <laughs> like, is that really it? Um, <laughs> that's great. Thank you, guys. I echo Mike. Um, but I also, I just wanted to thank you guys for um, allowing uh, Jesse Lynn's course to be certified by the state. My, I signed up my farm to take it, even, even though we're growers right now, um, just to stay in the loop and see what uh, retail was being taught. And it was a really great course. And um, it was just so nice because you guys, like you have been doing, are bringing in these legacy 
people into the fold, which hold, you know, generations of knowledge. Um, so that was great. And, um, but I think what Sarah was saying and what I was going to bring up is there were some state requirements that were a little overbearing as far as uh, substance use disorder and human trafficking. Um, and it's just, you know, as a legacy grower, it's just a little weird where you're like, is this the result of the lies we've been told for the better half of a century from the federal government about cannabis being really dangerous. So anyways, I know you guys know this um, and are trying to do the balancing act, but you know, I just got to throw out the comment just so you guys can make note like, Hey, we feel this way, but otherwise, thank you guys so much for bringing in uh, such great people because same with uh, the inspector. Uh, we had Chipper. Chipper was great. So good. And uh, Carrie, you know, trying to jump in and do this, um, tracking or the seed to sale for us instead of metric. Like, no, I do not want metric. So all these little things, it's great. Thank you guys so much. Jesse. Ben. Are you there, Ben? It looks like you were unmuted, Ben, but we cannot hear you. Ellie, do you want to maybe lower Ben's hand and move on, and then if yep. he jumps back in? All right, Ryan is next. Makes me wonder if it's us. Yeah, some, some people are having problems. Some yeah. people are. I don't know. Nelly, are you seeing Ryan unmute as well? He just did. Ryan, are you there? Um, okay. All right. Maybe maybe try Bridget. Yeah, Bridget is not is up next. Hi, thanks. Um, I just do want to, I, I appreciate that the state is um, trying to lower some of the barriers and some of the regulations that make this um, industry really burdensome and costly. Um, but I do have some concern about wet weight not being tracked because it is from harvest to the weighing the dry weight, the final product where diversion and inversion happen. Um, and I just think that those are important data points to have, uh, not just for the state regulators, but also for the producers. And I would recommend that producers do track their wet weights so they can track their efficiencies and attract their, you know, track their product um, effectively um, for their own purposes. So that's it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Ben or Ryan, are you able to... Unmute at this point. Sounds like we're, I think we're still having issues. Them. Well, um, if you can feel free to um, kind of submit your comments on our website. I apologize if this is something that's happening on our end. Um, if you join by a phone and would like to make a public comment, um, hopefully you can hit star six on mute yourself um, and uh, we'll try and hopefully work out any glitches that are happening. Oh, Ryan, I think we heard you there. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm really sorry, guys. Yeah, no, we can hear you. Good. I just want to say, Carrie's doing a great job. I'm really excited on like your small grower focus and bringing your own system in line. I know some people are really pushing for metric there. I work in multiple states, and I don't think metric's the answer, honestly. And I think uh, your pathway is great. And um, 
I'm really looking forward to what you guys are going to be doing in the future. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share my sentiments there with everyone else on the metric front. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Thanks, Ryan. Anyone else with a public comment, either by phone or by video? Um, Dan? Um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah, sorry, my internet's bad. Yeah, I just wanted to leave some feedback. You know, overall, I think that you guys have a really challenging job and have made incredible efforts. Just feedback that I think that I'd like to mention is, I think a way that could have made it more equitable for everybody in the state would have been to process one license type at a time. Let's get all the outdoor growers done. Then let's get all the indoor growers done. Then the manufacturers and then the retailers and process all the licenses before anybody can operate. You know, that way you could have said, okay, this is the final date. And if you're a retailer and you've applied for a license, if you've met the requirements, you've been processed and you can open at the same time. If you didn't meet the regulations and requirements, you don't get a license. But it just seems sad kind of seeing a market where some people will have an opportunity in the beginning to make an impact and other people won't. And so that's just my feedback is if you had just said, let's just take our time to make sure it's fair to everybody and given everybody a chance to participate equally at the same time. That way it would have been a more free market. It's like, we wanna see each other successful. You know, I wanna see other cultivators and Vermont cannabis entrepreneurs successful, but you know, it's like, we want to, we don't want it to be competitive. And you know, there ultimately will be a lot of people who can't enter the market from day one. So that's just the feedback that I have. Thanks, Dan. Jeffrey. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. I'll be brief. Uh, I just wanted to, from uh, Jeffrey Pisapello from Vermont Growers Association, uh, I just wanted to take a moment to express our gratitude to Kerry uh, and all of the work that he's been doing on this portal. Uh, we see you guys moving in the direction of Washington State. Uh, we think that is the ideal approach as of this moment in time for tracking uh, supply chain. Uh, and we want to thank you for the work that you've been doing for licensure. We heard that you may be slowing down some of that operation as you focus on other areas. We think that is fine. We just urge and we want to impress upon you to keep the licensing window open. We understand you won't be closing it uh, without public notification, but please keep that open and please continue to move forward uh, manufacturing and retail uh, applications, please. Um, just wanted to underscore that. And again, appreciate everyone's work. Uh, thank you, board, for what you are doing up to this point in time. And everybody have a good day. Thank you, Jeffrey. Any last, uh, last call for public comments? All right, I will uh, close the public comment window. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks to everyone out there who's put in an application and, or is licensed. Um, a really exciting time for Vermont. Um, I will um, adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.